Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, who's actually, uh, we are hosting a speaker from, uh, um, from another department within Northwestern. Our speaker is Dr. Lu Jing, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, his background is in geotechnical engineering. He received his PhD from the University of Hong Kong uh, 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 and joined Northwestern for a postdoc. And he's currently working on a broad range of topics, but focusing on segregation uh, problems. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lou, for accepting our invitation. Your slides are already visible. You can feel free to start whenever you're, you're ready. OK, thank you so much. Professor Baskarina for the introduction uh, and all the arrangement. I also want to thank Professor Paul and Ben, ben Hover for suggesting this opportunity to me. And so I'm a postdoc um, at Northwestern working with professors Rich Lupto, Julio Otino, and Paul and Ben Hover. And today I'm going to talk about my research on multi scale modeling of granular flows. And more than half of the work. Uh, I'm going to show today is done in, at Northwestern, but I will also talk about something I did during, my, during and right after my PhD. I would like to start with a very general statement of the motivation of the research. Of course, as a postdoc and former graduate students, I, my research is motivated by the professor's research. But as hopefully a, an independent researcher in the near future, I I've been thinking hardly uh, what my research is about. And uh, I study granular and granular fluid multiphase flows, which is a very important and very common processes in all of those natural and industrial processes. For example, in the context of climate change and sea level rise, coastal line uh, erosion has been a major threat to, to us. And, uh, there involves a lot of interactions of granular flow and fluids and a lot of increasing uh, geo hazards, landslide debris flow and the processing of uh, minerals in mining industry, as well as the metallic powder that we process in advanced uh, manufacturing. So the, the, the real motivation of the research here is really uh, to have a more sustainability uh, sustainable future and uh, to uh, mitigate the geo risk and improve our energy efficiency, all of those pricing challenges we face as a whole. But I think at this time, the modeling and better understanding of granular flow will become a more and more urgent needs that we will have to tackle together. But modeling granular flow is not that easy. One of the major challenges is the multi-scale nature of granular flow. On one hand, we, are, we want to have better predictive modeling of granular flow at the field scale. But on the other hand, we can never ignore the, the, the interactions and all of those uh, small scale fundamental processes underlying the, the large pro problem. So we have to look at the particle interactions at the microscopic scale. And we have to look at the Four chains and all those long range interactions at the meso scale. And of course, the continuum flowing at the macroscopic scale. But there's still a lot of complicated problems we need to tackle before we can go to the real field scale. And one particular thing about granular system is that the, separ the scale separation here is not really clear. And we, we in order to model the problem at one scale, we often need to understand what is going on at the lower scale. So to build the bridges connecting all those different scales would be of central importance here for the study. Uh, with this, I would like to view my career path to this point as to look for a multi-scale solution for the modeling of granular flow. And I did my PhD in Hong Kong with Dr. Fiona Koch. And uh, if you have been to Hong Kong, you know Hong Kong is really a beautiful place where you have combination of hill, mountainous and oceanic views. But one thing about the mountain, mountainous area and high population density in Hong Kong is that there's also a lot of threats from landslides and debris flows. So Hong Kong has doing 
a great job uh, mitigating the geo risks in the past, but in the in the current uh, increasing um, extreme weather and climate change, etc., we really are looking for better solutions that we can predict and model uh, landslides better from a multi-scale perspective. And during my study, I realized by just using computational geomechanics and all those stuff in geo geomechanical engineering, it's probably not enough for me to understand all the problem because debris flow is such a complicated problem with all those interactions of particles and fluids. And after, so in 2018, I spent a few months uh, in the University of Trent with Professor Anthony Thornton, who is a uh, applied mathematician with particular interest in granular flow, granular flow mechanics. And shortly after I returned to Hong Kong, I got a chance to join Northwestern to really formally explore the fascinating field of granular physics. So with this very kind of unique uh, multidisciplinary background of my research, I am now looking at the tackling the multi-scale challenge of granular flow by combining geomechanics, fluid mechanics, and soft matter physics. So to be more specific, when I started to look at debris flow, we wanted to look inside the flow and to model what is going on there, and then to understand the fundamental physics of the very high mobility of uh, debris flow. So I developed some uh, computational tools that combine like computational fluid dynamics and discrete element method so that we can simulate and the, the, the methods have been validated using small scale debris flow experiments. With those tools, I was able to really look inside, see what is going on there. And two problems that really interested me was the particle size segregation and the very uh, strange boundary effects that debris flow and granular flow encounter. So after I understand something there at the particle level, we would need a mathematical model to really represent those behaviors at continuum level. And that's the major work I'm doing here at Northwestern to develop a multi-scale mathematical model for particle size segregation in particular. And all of those advances of knowledge will eventually contribute to a better Lens, landslide mobility modeling where we can consider particle, particle, particle boundary and particle fluid interaction with more details. Today, I'm going to just focus on two pieces of the work here. One is the segregation modeling, which is basically particle, particle interaction. And another one is how particle interact with the boundary during a granular flow. And the first work is mainly done here at Northwestern where the other one is a continuing work after during and after my PhD. So I've already mentioned particle size segregation is kind of a major, one of the major challenges uh, we face in debris flow uh, modeling. And it, because you can see the large particles are usually being transported to the front and accumulate there. So this will increase the impact of debris flow on the downstream structures. But segregation is actually has much more important, uh, much wider uh, implications for other problems as well. For instance, here in river dynamics at a much longer time scale, particle size segregation will form a layer of armoring structure where coarse, grain, coarse grains are protecting smaller particles being eroded or uh, transported by the fluids especially after some construction of major dam and uh, reservoirs that we did, this kind of coarsening downstream will contribute to the, the delta drowning, for example, all over the world in a, a lot of major rivers. So this is one of the consequences that particle size segregation might contribute. And in the industry where we process particles that a lot of, a lot of different particle processing, so particle size segregation will compromise the mixing quality and therefore there will be some costly or even risky consequences out of that. So if you look at segregation, it's, it's a spontaneous process that very easily occur 
whenever we put some materials, granular materials consisting of different species to flow. So we, the, the major causes could be the difference in particle size, particle density, or particle shape. Here I focus mainly on particle size segregation, but the framework is general enough that we can account for other, um, other effects as well. So from a microscopic picture, one of the easiest, uh, simplest, and also probably the most useful understanding of particle segregation is kinetic sieving. That when particles are flowing, uh, they create a lot of opening voids where small particles tend to percolate under gravity. And at the same time, large particles being displayed upward. So this is the, the way particles separate from each other in a very general sense. At the microscopic level, we want to model this process. One way we can do is to use the transport equation. The transport equation describes how the concentration of one species I will evolve according to the advection diffusion and some fundamental segregation process that's going on. So the advection diffusion are pretty standard in any transport problem. Uh, of course, the diffusion diffusivity here for granular flow is, a, is kind of a, a, a area of research. But what's really tricky here is how the segregation flux is being formed and uh, we need to provide a closure as a constitutive, a constitutive relation for the segregation flux. So in our group here at Northwestern, we, there has been a lot of work going on for this uh, topic. And uh, a good reference would be the recent review published uh, in 2019. And you can see using this continuum model, we can basically model a flow layer on the surface where the concentration is evolving based on local flow conditions and species concentration, et cetera. But we, of course, we always want to make, to do, do better, right? To better, to con consider much more general situation and do uh, more predictive modeling. And this will require us to understand a little bit better about how particles segregate at the fundamental level. And there are still some challenges remain to improve that at the continuum level. One of the challenges is that segregation in large and small particles is not symmetric. So if we could zoom in and uh, simulate a periodic cell of segregation where we only have blue large and uh, white right, small particles, and the, this, the whole thing is, is flowing over a plane, an inclined plane, and uh, you can observe how large particles is migrating towards the surface as it's flowing. And we can further zoom in to look at how a single small particle is percolating downward. And it's pretty much like what we see at the, uh, based on kinetic sieving idea, a small particle is not very often in contact with other particles. When, when the particle is blue, it's in contact with others. Well, if it's gray, it's basically percolating. But for the large particles, things are very different. When the large particle is migrating upward, it has the enduring persistent contact with the neighboring particles, which is showing as blue here. And the direction of the contacts form a shear pattern that rolls the particle upward. So this very different process at the particle level would imply that we shouldn't treat large and small particles at the continuum level symmetrically. The, uh, the behavior is fundamentally different. Although in recent years, there has been asymmetric segregation functions has been proposed, but we generally like uh, understanding about what is going on and how to model it. Another challenge is segregation can be induced by gravity and shear. They are, these are two different process. Like in many of these free surface flows that we usually look at, where kinetic sieving is a, is a major process, uh, that, that surrogation is gravity driven, as I just shown before. But there are also cases where surrogation is occurring in the direction perpendicular to gravity. Like in a lateral fault, we will see a kind of a nonlinear velocity profile perpendicular to gravity, but you could still observe migration of large particles to one side, which is not driven by gravity. And the other case would be vertical shoot, where surrogation is going on laterally, but gravity is pointing downward. So 
apparently some shear gradients or in some cases granular temperature gradients would also drive segregation. And in a general situation, actually gravity and shear should work together to, to drive segregation. Like if we have a late driven uh, flow where we create a very strong shear gradient, but everything is under gravity, the segregation should be driven by both mechanisms. And another example is the riverbed erosion, riverbed, riverbed evolution where particles segregate because of the fluid flow and the shear gradients and gravity altogether. So we are really need a, we really need a segregation model that can consider gravity and shear at the same time and understand what are the relative importance of the two mechanisms so that we are seeking for a universal constitutive segregation model. So we observe a lot of those things at the particle level and we believe all those simple interaction at the particle level would eventually determine what it looks like at continuum level. So it's really great if we could build a bridge to plug those microscopic mechanisms into continuum, uh, continuum approach. And the, this, this is a project that is funded by NSF at Northwestern. And uh, I'm, I have a chance to work on this. And the major, the, the main approach that we are using is a force approach where, whereby we're looking at the forces acting on the particle when the particle is being segregated. The, the forces, there are basically two, two forces here. One is gravity. The other one, all the other forces are coming from the contacts between the, the particle and other particles. And if we are able to get a net force, which we call a segregation force here, we can easily determine where the particle goes and what the velocity is. This is the basic idea of this force approach. But determining the segregation force is also not as easy as it appears. We, we may think we can simply measure the force in experiments or at least in DM simulations, right? We have all the information of the force. But the problem is because surrogation occurs in nearly always in the equilibrium, equilibrium and the forces that we measure on the particle is always cancel out with the, with the gravity. So we cannot distinguish what forces are driving surrogation, what forces are resist surrogation. In order to do that, we're using a so-called force meter here. Um, it, the idea is like an optical tweezer, but we, we have a spring that uh, is attached to the to one of the particles. And then we create a local flow condition so that the particle is going to segregate. And this spring will apply a restoring force to the, to the, the intruder particle, what we call here, and then to hold the particle in position. So how much force is the spring apply to hold the particle in position will tell us how much force is that is driving segregation in the first place. So the statistics of the forces on the spring that we got can tell us both the mean force that drives segregation and also fluctuations, both of which have very important implications. But here I will mainly talk about the mean segregation force and then we change the flow condition and particle property to see how Segregation force is a function of those conditions. And then because this is working at the very fundamental level, this could give us a unified description of gravity and shear induced segregation forces. And there is also a built-in asymmetric behaviors in large and small particles. And in the outlook, I will talk about how we might link these particle level forces to continuum formulation. Another thing we need to do before we can measure the force is to create um, any flow, local flow conditions we want. And this is also not easy because uh, remember we are going to separate the, the, the mechanism of gravity and shear driven segregation, but decoupling this is, but the shear profile is usually affected by gravity. We will, we will need a technique that we can vary shear profiles and then gravity induced pr uh, profiles independently. The way we do is to use a control velocity shear cell where we apply stabilizing force for, for, on every particle without changing the granular, uh, basic granular behavior. We're able to impose literally any arbitrary velocity profile independently of gravity. Uh, what we choose here is first we impose homogeneous shear 
that means the constant shear rate. And we can also impose inhomogeneous shear where we can create either a positive or neg negative curvature. And then here I'm looking at the case where there's no gravity. And if we have a linear velocity profile, there's no surrogation force measured. If we have a concave up, concave down velocity profile, positive shear rate gradient, we have a positive force. And if it's a negative shear rate gradient, we have a negative force. So apparently the surrogation force is proportional to the shear rate gradient that we impose. And now we can do a very simple dimensional analysis. In this problem, we apply an uh, overburden pressure, we apply a shear rate, and we impose the shear rate gradient. And the particle has some dimensions compare, compared to the other particles. So the force, we, we, we use P d squared as the force scale, and we use the d over gamma dot as the shear rate gradient scale to normalize the two key uh, variables here. And then by reformulate this, we, we get a surrogation force driven purely by shear that it is proportional to the shear rate gradient in this way. Another thing is if we change the particle size to a smaller one, that then we can see the direction of surrogation force will change. So that means the force here is also dependent of particle size ratio. So R is the size ratio of this particle about other particles. And we finally got this uh, scaling law for the surrogation force induced by shear, which has a prefactor, which is a function of R. So now we are going to look at the, the other component, the gravity driven surrogation force. And we impose only here, we only look at a uniform shear where there's no shear induced surrogation force as we just um, understood. And then if we turn off gravity, we will have a constant pressure. There's no pressure gradient and we don't measure any segregation force. And if we turn on gravity, we have a positive segregation force pointing upward. At the same time, because we turn on gravity, there will be, the, the particle will feel uh, gravity. So you can also see that the segregation force is generally larger than the weight of the intruder. This means the particle will be driving upward. On the other hand, if we change the particle to a smaller one, again, there's no, there's no surrogation force when there's no gravity, but when gravity is on, we, we observe a positive segregation force, but it is smaller than the weight of the, the particle. So the particle now will sink downwards. Again, based on dimensional analysis, we can, we can see the segregation force driven by gravity is proportional to the pressure gradient and then we can actually work out a buoyancy-like force where the, we still have a prefactor that is a function of the intruder size ratio. So this is the size ratio corrected buoyancy force. Now, more formally, I can show you the quantitative results of this scaling law. The surrogation force driven by, by shear is uh, it's basically a curve looks like this, that what I plot here vertically is a, the segregation force induced by shear over the, the shear rate, rescaled shear rate gradient here, and horizontally is the, is the size ratio. So this curve is a curve of the prefactor. For the gravity driven curve, we all, in the case, we also have a curve like this, where if you look closer, when particle is smaller, the intruder particle is smaller than others, we have a tangible results. You know, to provide some color on our first two strategies, Focusing on that PM day part in value, we want there, to there, there's probably somebody last year to offer. Okay, sorry, you, you can go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. was somebody Thanks. who yeah. activated there. So, so here, um, yeah. So so the both two terms actually have very similar shape, but if you look closer, they are they are they are different because this curve go negative when the particle is small, it's positive when the particle is large. Well, in this gravity-driven case, it's below one when the particle is small, when it's, it's above one when it's large. But in any way, we can see uh, this is a way that we can connect particle level interactions with continuum flow fields. And here, uh, what we see is when particles are small, they are percolating so that they feel a smaller net force. And when the particles are bigger, they start to have this frictional 
contacts with surrounding particles. But when the size ratio is about two, this contacts network is very described. Whereas if the particle is further enlarged towards the continuum limit, the interaction on the surface is quite uniform, although they are also frictional and enduring. So this kind of in microscopic interaction explains the shape of the curve. And the curve here serves as a bridge between the microscopic interaction and continuum flow fields. Another thing I want to mention is the two curves are not symmetric about R equals one. That means small particle and large particle, they behave differently. Another thing I want to point out is uh, here different color represents different local inertia numbers. That means we are changing the flow condition, overburden pressure, shear rate, et cetera, so that we are looking at these from quasi-static to inertial flow, quite a range of flow conditions that we vary. But the resulting scaling law for the two forces uh, nearly collapsed on a single curve. With this, we, we want to validate if this kind of combination of the two terms works for other more general situations. What we use here are wall-driven flows, inclined wall-driven uh, vertical silo flow, and inclined shoot flow. Those are very classic um, elementary flows for granular flow study. And for wall-driven flow, because we have gravity on, we have a we have a nonlinear velocity profile, uh, which give us a positive uh, shear driven force. So all the points we see are on the positive side because both mechanisms work in the same direction. But if we change the slope of this wall driven flow, if there is a chance that we will change the curvature of the velocity profile, that will induce the negative force coming from the shear part. And this might counterbalance the gravity driven force. That's why the force we see could be zero or negative. In the vertical shoot flow, we, have an, we always have a negative curvature because segregation going on horizontally. And then because also there's no gravity acting in this case, we always have negative forces acting on the uh, negative segregation forces. And in inclined shoot flows, although we would have some nonlinear velocity profile, but it's very small compared to the gravity induced term. That's why the, the results are always here concentrated near zero but these, they are positive. So with all those validations, we show that the two terms we found, they are additive and they're universal for a lot of different um, test simulations. And therefore by using this very fundamental force, uh, particle level force scale, uh, we hope we will go all the way to the real problems where it could be either driven by shear gravity or the combination of shear and gravity. To do that, we will need to go from forces. We, we need to figure out all the forces on individual particles at the microscopic level. So, so far I've been talking about the segregation driving force. But there's also another important thing is the drag force which resists the separation of two different species. But I won't have time to, to go into this. But this is the research that is currently going on at the group. And then with some homogenization, we will go from particle level forces to stress or stress gradients in RVE level for each, uh, for each species. And then based on momentum equation, we can derive segregation flux model. It's a pretty standard fluid dynamics approach and plug this flux model into the continuum segregation transport equation. And then I also want to emphasize again here that all the research that is doing here is general. It could be, it could work for density segregation shape and even adding cohesion fluids because we are working on the very fundamental particle level and the density part especially has been published already and uh, once we have this general uh, scaling uh, general constituted model uh, transport equation that consider particle level physics we can combine this with some sort of flow mobility model so that we can in the future uh, model and predict more realistic situations there's another thing I really need to talk about is when we go from forces at the particle level to the stresses in RVE level, we will need to figure out what is the concentration dependence of the forces because that, that is really the key that we, we don't automatically know. And this is also a part of the work that is going on here is, uh, is in collaboration with my colleague, Yifei Duan. And uh, so, so far, the results have been showing is for a single intruder particle where the if we 
talk about the concentration of this intruder particle is clear is close to zero. And then we can also try to increase the concentration of these intruder particles. And eventually we will go to another limit where it's a monodisperse flow of large particles where the concentration is one. So actually, if we plot the force and concentration in this, in this map, we already know to the, the values for the two limits. One is the intruder case, that's the forces I just measured. The other one is the monodisperse flow because we know particles in equilibrium, the forces acting on the particle equals the weight of the particle. So we know the other limit. The, the, the question is what it looks like in between the two limits. So by using some techniques that I won't have time to explain here, we are able to measure the segregation force as a function of the concentration. And it's, it looks like a very, it's quite a smooth and monotonic transition from the intruder limit to general bidispersed mixtures. And uh, another thing is the curve is nonlinear. There is a plateau here for small concentrations. That means when we just add a few intruder particles, the, part, the intruder particles would not see each other and they, they don't affect the behavior on each other. But beyond a critical concentration, we start to see a change of the surrogation force because of concentration. So this would be uh, serving as a very important bridge that can link the forces of individual particles to stress in the RVE scale. Another thing I want to talk about is actually the flow mobility model. This is another whole uh, area of research that we need to figure out before we can do uh, uh, more, uh, that, like more general prediction. So the transport equation we are using so far, we have uh, some flow information that is the U here, which is pre-described. Pre but in a more general sense, we will want to solve the flow mobility and uh, couple that with the transport equation. But to solve flow mobility, we will, for example, if we use a hydrodynamic modeling approach, we will need to know what is the rheology of the granular flow. And we also need to provide the, the, provide the simulation with boundary conditions. There has been a lot of advances in the past decades about the rheology of granular flow. But boundary condition is much less studied. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about in the next part. I hope I have time, yeah. So for the second part, I will be focusing on boundary effects in granular flow. And uh, if we look at a granular flow or debris avalanche along the slope, the mobility and also the erodibility of the flow depends very much on what kind of base you have. You could have some soil uh, mental base where it's very easily uh, erodes. You also have some back road base where erosion is not easy, but you have a lot of bumpy, bumpy surface. So boundary condition is not clear for those cases. And another thing is the boundary condition in granular flow is not just important for granular flow over the hill slope. It's also important for sediment transport in rivers. So the roughness of the riverbed will determine the transport rate, basically. Another thing is in particle technology. When you have a smooth wall or a rough wall, that will significantly change the dynamics and even the surrogation pattern. So boundary condition for granular flow is has very important implications, but modeling the boundary condition is actually not an easy task. One way is we can think of granular flow as a fluid so that we impose a no slip boundary condition. But that, that's not the case because granular flow slips over even rough boundaries. Another idea is borrowing is borrowed from sol solid mechanics is we could apply a coolant friction to the granular flow. If the problem is coolant friction has a constant friction coefficient, which is generally not the case for granular flow. So for granular flow, the boundary condition depends on wall friction and geometric roughness and even the dynamics of the flow because everything is really dependent. It's somehow similar to micro or nano fluids, but 
the boundary condition is not clear. We don't know what the slip velocity is. We don't know what the basal shear stress or friction at the boundary is. In order to study that, as I always do, I would like to look at very fundamental level how uh, periodic uh, elementary flow interact with different uh, surfaces. And then this represents uh, a piece of the flow when it's flowing down a slope. And then I generate different rough boundaries using different approaches. I can control the thickness of the layer. I can control the piking density of those particles that are fixed on the surface. And I can also give a regular piking so that I generate a wide range of different surface roughnesses. Um, but now the question is, how can we define the roughness? We don't know which one is rougher, right? So, and which one is rough enough so that the granular flow would not slip and which was not rough enough so we will have some sort of slip. So in order to understand what contribute to geometric roughness, um, we think of a single particle that is flowing on a, a line of fixed particles. If the particle is going like this, we have some sort of slip velocity. And if, we, if the particle is smaller, we have the, the, the base is basically rougher. And then with the particle is bigger, the base is smoother relatively. Another thing is we increase the space of those fixed particles that will also create different roughness. Another thing is we, we might have different layers. Sometimes the bottom layers, the lower layers, it doesn't matter, but sometimes it will also interact with lower layers. So this base roughness is basically a function of size ratio spacing and layering. In order to define a single parameter that tell us the roughness of the surface for granular flow, I, I take a general surface where we have some particles here and do some tri triangulation uh, on the plane or the, where the project. And then we, I will end up with a lot of different triangles. For each triangle, there is an area. This area uh, tells us whether we can, if we have a flow particle over the area, whether it will be trapped or it's just slip away. So there is a most stable situation where the particle can be just put into the void that will give us area AM and all the other general cases will get area AI. And I use a ratio of AI and uh, AM to define a local roughness. And then I do a statistics to get the mean roughness over the whole, the whole uh, boundary. By doing this, I also change the size ratio between the base particle. Hello, hello. It can yes. indicate whether sleep occurs or not. Sorry. Yeah, you interrupted for a second. Maybe, maybe it was me, sorry. Okay, yeah. So uh, this, this can serve as a single parameter tells us whether sleep will occur or not. Note that here I have a lot of different arrangements of fluid particles. I also have a different size ratio, different slope angle, etc. So all of those kind of form on a single line where we can indicate what the steep velocity is based on just the geometric roughness. So I want to show you how to model these boundary effects in continuum theory by giving two examples. The first example is, uh, is to consider the basal sliding law for uh, depth average for shallow granular flow modeling. So this depth average equation for shallow water modeling is, is basically a, a momentum equation that describe the behavior of the flow. And on the left-hand side, this is the rate of change of momentum. On the right-hand side are all the forcing terms. The first term is gravity. The second term is the resistance coming from the base. This is the base for the resistance. And third term is because of the, uh, the, the pressure gradient that it creates. So the internal lateral pressure gradient. And other terms are pretty straightforward. The major thing here is what the what friction we should put here for the basal resistance. And this is more like a constitutive model for the shallow granular flow. And there has been constant uh, friction models at the classic model. And then Pulikan in 1999 proposed that the, the 
friction should be rate dependent. It depends on the thickness of flow and float number. That is the velocity of the flow. And there are also some empirical models that consider velocity weakening at this level. So this macroscopic, uh, so what I focus on here is Pulikin's model. This mi macroscopic friction should have something to do with what is going on at the macro level where I will add the friction or the roughness of the boundary in. This work is in collaboration with Anthony Thornton in the University of Twente. And to do that, I first want to briefly review what Pulikin skidding law is about. And uh, when we have a granular flow, we can change the slope angle and we can change the thickness of the flow. But there is a certain combination of thickness of uh, and thickness and the slope angle that there's no flow anymore. And we will, we will have a layer of granular materials on the surface. And this is called H stop curve. And this curve encodes some constitutive behavior of the granular material. And then we can also measure the mean velocity when given, given a certain flow thickness and theta. And it, the Pulikin has found that if we normalize the thickness of the flow by this H stop curve, we are able to collapse all the data in a single, as a single function. And this could serve as a constitutive law for shallow granular flow. And this actually eventually leads to the famous mu ideology later on. But the problem here is this approach works only for rough or no sleep conditions. When, so here I reproduce the cases by using 2D PM simulations. I use different thickness, different theta, but I also add another dimension of variable, which is a roughness. I can also get the H stop curve, but when I look at the velo mean velocity of the flow, uh, right means I have a rough base and blue means I have a smooth base. And from blue to right, the velocity is increasing because of the basal sleep, but this has not been considered in Pulikin's uh, skating law so that it only works for the right symbols here, but not the blue ones. And in order to consider those basal sleep, here I invoke the basal slip skating that is a function of the roughness I, I just showed in earlier. And then by excluding this basal slip from the bottom, we're able to collapse all the data to a single, single skating law. And then we can fit this into shallow water modeling so that if we have a general situation where the flow go from smooth bottom to a rough bottom where they might create a hydraulic jump, this approach should work as a single a constitutive model. Another idea that can make use of this uh, particle level understanding of flow boundary interaction is if we look closer at what is going on when sleep occurs, the particle actually could dilate near the bottom. There are some very uh, frequent collisions between the particle and the boundary when sleep occurs, whereas when there's no sleep, it stays very close to the boundary. So we can think about this as a momentum transfer because the, when there is a velocity profile, there is some basal slip here. Uh, the basal slip is the horizontal momentum, represents the horizontal momentum of the particle. And this vertical collision will, there are some momentum transfer when the particle collide with the, with the, with the boundary. This vertical velocity is actually the fluctuation of the velocity, which is proportional to the local shear rate. So based on some momentum balance, we can actually work out that the slip here should be proportional to the local shear rate. And another thing is the how, much, how much energy dissipated here depends on the roughness as well, because at every collision, the energy dissipation will be different if we have a different contact angle. So that means this basal slip should be a function of RA multiplied by the shear rate, local shear rate. And from my DM simulation, I did get this kind of skating law for the local shear rate and local uh, slip velocity, which is a function of RA only. And then if we could plug this into some continual modeling, comparing this with no slip boundary condition or constant friction boundary, boundary condition, this microscopically informed slip boundary condition works better when comparing with DM simulation that is a black profile here. And here are some uh, videos showing the three conditions you can see when we impose no sleep 
the granular behavior at the front is very unrealistic. And if we use constant friction, there are some very high shear here, whereas the micro informed sleep boundary condition that we proposed kind of work more naturally for granular flow. So to conclude, I have been uh, looking at granular flow, particularly debris flow as an example. And I look at the internal um, particle interaction that leads to segregation and the interaction of particle with the boundary that leads to sleep and no sleep boundary condition. And I propose some unifying uh, framework for gravity and shear driven segregation and some unifying framework for sleep and no sleep boundary conditions. So I want to uh, conclude that the macroscopic modeling of granular flow can be informed by particle level physics. And what we need to do is to build a bridge and the way I build a bridge is by using all the knowledge that I've been trained in geomechanics, fluid mechanics, and soft matter physics, so that in the future we can go towards more predictive modeling of the flow of granular materials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. Very nice presentation. Thank Thanks. you so much. So I see reactions all around. So, uh, okay, so we can open it for questions. I see uh, Zdenek raising his hand. So Zdenek, please unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Very interesting summary of the rule. Uh, Thanks. Uh, one thing, uh, though you left out, and I worked about 20 years ago with McClung from, uh, from British Columbia on avalanches. Mm -hmm. And in avalanches, actually, the main thing is triggering. Once the triggering, trigger it goes. Mm. And the triggering is really a fracture problem, and it has a side effect, like in yeah. like in fracture mechanics. It's a combination right. of the first steering vertical crack, which is a side effect, and then starting the slip, which is also a side effect. Yeah. So that's a very interesting problem. And you mentioned boundary conditions. This is. Okay, right, right. initial boundary condition, right? Mm. So that's, uh, I think, for uh, for many slides, also in your techniques, also triggering is probably the main thing, right? Right. Yeah. Once it starts going, you cannot stop it. So mm -hmm. uh, I, that's just a point I wanted to make. It's a it's a it was an outstanding review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bazan. Thank you, Zdenek, for your comment. Uh, other questions? So please raise your digital hand or unmute yourself. If you wish to ask questions, don't necessarily see anybody. So I, I may ask a quick one, Lou. I, I enjoyed very much, and maybe I, I, I missed a few uh, details that you may have mentioned. So sorry if, uh, if that's mm -hmm. my, uh, sure. to my fault. When you showed the, the um, shear induced segregation force, a key element, if I'm not mistaken, is the gradient of the strain rate, right? Yeah. It's that function, the spatial gradient of the strain rate. Is that one something you have to assume or is it model generated? Like, I mean, you need to run a simulation for a particular case to uh, 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 define that function. Or if there is any standard assumption that domain, can you elucidate mm. what, what that would be? Yes, so when we study and get the basic scaling for the force, we do impose different shear rate gradient uh, profiles so that we, we vary the profile so that we know how the force reacts with different profiles. But we also validate this in many other geometries where the profile is emergent. It's not what we impose. Like you have different boundary condition, uh, body forces so that you create different flow fields. But it turns out that the scaling we get from this controlled flow works pretty well based on my test for other more general cases. So we, we believe this is going towards the constitutive relation for segregation forces. Okay, okay, I understand. And so another question that they had was about the, and you mentioned it at the beginning in your analysis, you looked at uh, DEM coupled with uh, uh, fluid flow analysis, poor fluid flow analysis. In your segregation analysis, you focus the given the complexity of the problem, if I understand, on dry systems. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But you see, the final problems on the brief flow that you showed, they are usually, you know, in saturated environments. Mm -hmm. They are triggered right, by yeah. water. So, what would be the, the 
in your opinion, I know it's a difficult yeah. question, but in your view, what would be the the presence of a pore fluid mm -hmm. uh, change in this dynamic right. yeah. of uh, segregation you have described? That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So we actually have some preliminary uh, study on that. And uh, simply speaking, when we have a fluid, especially when, when everything is saturated, it's, it's under underwater or we, we consider saturated flow first. And then the fluids will, in, will introduce some buoyancy force some drag force when you have velocity going on. So let's say uh, we have buoyancy effect and drag effect. Drag is because segregation is a very slow process. The relative velocity of the particle and fluid will be small. So the drag is actually based on our observation. Is the drag will not uh, really affect segregation unless you have really viscous fluid. Mm -hmm. You have like in real case, you have mud or some some other like fluids that really have make go go to the viscous regime. The stocks number is really small. There could be a viscous effect on segregation, but in other cases, like you just have water and some uh, sense uh, scale particles, which is in a inertial regime. This kind of drag effect is not obvious. And for the buoyancy, buoyancy on one hand, it will reduce the weight of particles. On the other hand, it will reduce, because as I show, uh, segregation force, part of it is a, is a pressure gradient driven. And buoyancy force will change pressure gradient, but it will change pressure gradient proportionally to the change of the, the weight. So the buoyancy effect actually cancel out. Yeah, I understand. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Questions from the audience, from other students. I don't have a question, but to fill the silence, I'll say, so I have apologies that I uh, came late, so I can't ask an intelligent question. It looked like a really fascinating talk. The part that I, uh, that I was able to catch looked like really strong work, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm gonna ask a question. So um, Lou, one of the things you mentioned at the end with regard, and you demonstrated this with the boundary conditions on how that affects, you know, both the run out and kind of the, the shear rate in these um, landslide flows. And this is something I think is Greg, Greg Wagner was on this talk at some point, I saw his name, but this is something that, you know, we looked at with one of our previous graduate students and with Greg a little bit about, there he is, about you know, coupling the segregation to the flow dynamics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'll ask two questions. So one is, under what circumstances do you think that the segregation is going to be important in changing the dynamics of the flow? You know, when, mm -hmm. when is there going to be a lot of feedback between the dynamics and the segregation? Yeah. And the second point is, do you think it would be possible to, say, like in Hong Kong, you know, alter the boundary condition on a slope. So once it started to slide to reduce mm. segregation, so you don't get the buildup of all these large boulders at the front of these mm. landslides that do a lot of the damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, actually, there are some ongoing work uh, about how you couple the flow dynamics and segregation and see whether it's just a natural combination because in, in rheology or any constituted models, you will have to put in some particle size information. If you have segregation, you have a different particle size distribution. But most continuum models do not see the distribution of particles, but you just take some mean parameter, like mean D, D50, D84 as the input parameter. In this sense, and it has been demonstrated some, somewhere that in this sense, the particle size distribution does not affect the rheology very much. But on the other hand, segregation will definitely change flow dynamics. One of the problem is when small particles percolate to the bottom, it change how the flow interacts with the bottom. That's not a rheology problem. It's more like a mechanical process where particle embedded in voids will lubricate the flow. And I haven't mentioned fluids. When there is fluids, particle size distribution will change pore pressure excess pore pressure, et cetera, that will change flow mobility a lot everywhere. So I think a lot of things need to be done 
in order to really couple nicely the two components. And for the other question, it, it sounds like an interesting idea to mitigate the risk uh, by controlling segregation because I, I never thought to control segregation in real uh, landslide. I know we, we can do that in industrial settings where we, we create different boundary condition or uh, slope angle, et cetera, to, to minimize segregation. But in real geometry, I think it would be very interesting if we can show different boundary conditions induce different shear profile. And then these two different segregation uh, phenomenon that will be uh, one of the strategies we can follow. And, and I think I think we were talking a couple of days ago, and I think one of the reasons I mentioned this is maybe someone with a better memory than I do. I we had someone from Hong Kong. I don't think from your university, but from another Hong Kong university, give a talk maybe ten years ago, and he was talking about terracing. I think you know the effects of terracing the slopes in terms of reducing landslides. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you know, obviously people have done things to reduce landslide risk yeah, in terms yeah. of changing the geometry, but it just the yeah. boundary condition sounded like it could be interesting. Yeah, I, th I think usually they have some some structures to dissipate the energy yeah. so that it's softer when it impacts the yeah. downstream. All right, great, thanks. Thank you. And uh, uh, I may interject with a follow-up question on this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, in, in your analysis, you start with uh, and assume the polydispersity or with, I saw bi-dispersed particles, mm -hmm. big and small. Mm -hmm. uh, in nature, the brief flow are however fed by a process which is called entrainment, is a sort of right. continuous triggering as the right. flow goes. So the accumulation of the, in your opinion, in most cases, the fact that you have boulders, is it more an outcome of you know, the dynamics mm -hmm. that the flow has reached the, and what it is able to entrain, including yeah. boulders that then become, you know, yeah. form a sort of top armor, or is it more, you know, you start with it, you move it along mm -hmm. and then, you know, it, it, yeah. it I, I think I think all of those could happen. Uh, so one thing is if you come down with some boulders already in the flow, it definitely will migrate to the surface. And then because surface is faster, it will be transported to the front. That's one kind of recirculation process that can move large particles. Another thing is, it can erode particles from the pathway and that could occur as well, depending on what material you have along the, the, the channel. So I think it's a multi, it's kind of a multi-process problem and both has to be considered. And speaking of entrainment, I think, uh, I'm glad you asked because the boundary effect study I did actually is very relevant to erosion because in order for us to model erosion in a mechanistic way, we will need to know the sliding velocity and the shear stress that the flow imposes on the, on the ground. And that is where the slip velocity and shear stress at the boundary comes in. And using this and depending on the strength of the material at the, at the, on the ground, we, we could determine whether erosion would occur, whether large particle can be eroded or not. Very nice. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. This has been a good discussion. I'm just looking around to see if there are other hands being raised or people willing to ask questions. Okay. There is one. Hello. This is Hi. Avi Singh from uh, yeah. Hello. Chicago. I've, Hello. I've been following your, the great work you've been doing. Thanks. So, uh, I, I mean, this might not be a question, but more of a uh, your, your thoughts on it. So uh, in nature, is it, it's, it's, it's possible that different size particles might have different uh, friction. Uh, yeah. So have you, have you thought about how uh, different, uh, yeah. how uh, uh, particle friction and mm -hmm. uh, if you have mixed particles with different friction. Right. Wait, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Could affect the, the, the segregation. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Actually, we did study different surface frictions during segregation because as I mentioned, the way we look at segregation from forces on particles is a, it's kind of a fundamental level where we measure the force, you already consider the surface friction. And then when we turn off surface friction, the result is that the, the forces that support large particles to go up will reduce. 
-hmm. especially when the friction go towards zero. And in my results, friction parameter greater than 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.3 does not change the result a lot. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when it's in between zero and 0 0.3, the forces supporting particle upward will reduce mm -hmm. so that even a large particle could sink instead of rise as we expected. Yeah. Yeah, so everything could mm -hmm. be embedded in the yeah. force model. Yeah. I mean, the one reason I, I asked this is uh, uh, there was a study, I think, around 2006 or 2007 by uh, Anthony Thornton and uh, John Gray, his uh, PhD supervisor, and they looked at this finger formation down the chute and oh, they yeah, explained yeah. it based on. Uh, that the small particles probably have smaller friction and the large particles yeah, yeah. have large friction. So they, yeah. so, uh, but uh, I mean, I did my PhD in granular materials, but I haven't. No, I, mean, yeah. I remember I, it. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, I haven't seen, uh, I don't know. I might be wrong that I might not have seen people simulating that uh, with DEM and coming up with the, with the similar result. I think there have been um, continuum simulation showing that. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I I remember the work. So in the model, the because you want the particle to recirculate at mm -hmm. the front of a debris flow, and one of the conditions is that the large particle when they reach the front, they has to be less mobile. Yeah. So that they uh, they will stop the flow and being embedded and then go up again. This kind of recirculation. And one of the reason for that is large particles are more irregular in shape. Yeah, less rounded so that they have more surface friction. Yeah, yeah. great work, great work. Thanks. But Thank I you. Also, want to add, there's that fellow from uh, Budapest, the Hungarian guy, whose name mm -hmm. I could never remember, who's done you know yeah. spherical particles, only differences friction, and you know you can get segregation in there too. Not, I don't think he was in an avalanche geometry. But. Yeah, uh, I think there was, was some work by Janos Torok where they even studied spherical particles with different friction. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, he He was a German guy too, as the co-author on one of those papers, but yeah, only friction. Friction's the only difference and that certainly can drive segregation. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for participating to the discussion and the presentation. Thank you, Lou, for the fantastic talk. Uh, so it's past everyone. noon, so for the interest of time, thank again for everybody who attended. See you the next time. Bye.